So um, yeah, thanks for joining. And um, then I think we're gonna start today with like the very uh, yeah mass spec fundamentals and, and in particular um, ionization. Okay, so now um, one very very important thing, and I hope especially like the um, the people who, who who just like started or gonna start with mass spectrometry um, gonna take home from from this seminar today, and that is that contemporary mass spectrometry, and in particular that type of mass spectrometers we have in our labs, um, they display um, spectra of molecular masses. Um, and those uh, masses are shown for ions. So contemporary mass spectrometry always shows mass over charge. And, and this is like incredible, important for a lot of like the tools and data analysis approaches we, we um, eventually um, gonna use later on. So and, and in theory, like a mass spec is just like a very, very precise balance in, in which we can um, weight molecules. Um, and that, yeah, is displayed as, as a mass over charge because those molecules, as you can see here for like the moic acid, for example, is actually an ion because it's uh, um, a progenated in, in, in this particular case. And yes, I said, this, is, this has important implications. So please, that's, if you don't take anything else from the lecture today, that, that's the most important thing probably, mass per charge. Um, okay, and so now, yeah, we, we weight those ions and, and we get like um, their, their masses. And the cool thing is that, that high resolution mass spectrometry in particular is so precise that simply by the exact masses of each of those atoms, we can like calculate ratios um, of the atoms that, that eventually result in a, in a very particular mass. So here it would be 312.1441639, right? And then there's only like a few possibilities of combinations of atoms. So yeah, this is already like, I think a very essential structural information. And yeah, um, as you may know, like people are like increasingly using this for like the analysis of biomolecules in particular metabolites or proteins, but also like other um, um, atoms or other biomolecules. So um, I think it's a powerful tool and I hope that, that we can um, use this extensively in, in our research in the future. Um, so yeah, again, just uh, um, a little background on like the mass. Yeah, mass is an SI unit, um, yeah, typically measured in, in grams. Um, but what we're gonna use here is typically Dalton. So this is 1 12th uh, of the mass of a, um, of a C12 um, isotope. And yeah, this is uh, yeah, generally, um, I think the, the, the mass unit, Dalton. Again, we will display this as M over C, so mass per charge. Again, this is the main take home message for today, mass per charge. All right, and then when we look at the mass spec, um, most of them are, are built up in a, in a certain uh, way. So we have kind of like an inlet here at the left, Right, then that's where we bring in the sample. And then often in combination with that inlet, we have an ion source because we need to like make ions out of like the, the molecules. So we need to charge them in order to measure them. And then here we have a mass analyzer. So that can be yeah, like different types of physical principles to, to actually like separate um, like the different masses or like to, to measure the masses. And then there is a detector. Um, and normally um, all of this is like happening under vacuum. So we have like tubal molecular pumps. Uh oh, mute. Oh yeah, so please, um, if you don't wanna like comment on anything, please make sure that you're muted. Um, okay, and then yeah, like of course we have like extensive electronics that like controls like these different elements and then typically like interfaces like the mass spec with a computer, which I think becomes more and more important because like they're so fast and we can do like some, some sorts of like fancy experiments with them and a, and a computer needs to obviously um, control that. Okay, so yeah, going to like that first section now. So I think this is gonna be the main content for um, for today, we want to like talk about how we actually make those ions. And yeah, again, contemporary mass spectrometry 
measures ions. So like those are charged molecules and, and that has a couple of reasons. First of all, it, it makes them like easily to handle in, in, in electronic fields. So by yeah, like having a charge, we can actually like manipulate their trajectories. We can focus them, which like is of course very important for like sensitivity of the instruments so that, that they really like come into like a, um, a defined space inside of the instrument. And then we also use them to accelerate them or like yeah, to, to separate them by like different um, uh, physical principles to which we will probably come um, next time. Um, so then, yeah, like, um, as I mentioned, like the neutral gas um, species, they're, they're going to typically be, um, be evaporated through a high vacuum system. Um, and then, yeah, we only ideally have um, our molecules as ions inside of the mass spec. So, yeah, we, we need ions. This is important. So that's why um, we have different um, possibilities to ionize. And I see Christoph has a, has a raised hand question. Yeah, I have already a question. So are there compounds which cannot be obtained as ions, so um, which have get very difficult to produce mm -hmm. ions? Yeah, yeah that's, that's a very good question. And I think depending on the technology we use, um, this can be indeed be difficult. So um, yeah, like one of like the main things which I will get to um, in, in a second, electrospray ionization will not work for every molecule. So, and I think this has important implications if we think about chemical space. And here on this slide is, I think it's actually a very nice example of chemical space. Um, I took 1 million different molecules which uh, I obtained from like different bio databases from my coworker um, Kai Dürkop at the, at the um, University of Vienna. And I plotted simply their molecular weight versus the calculated log P. So this is a measure of polarity. And I think this is really cool because it shows you a little bit like how diverse molecules can be. First of all, over like mass, but then also over polarity, which has something to do with like, yeah, like the number of heteroatoms um, in them. And now we, we see how, how there's like a nice distribution with like, so I plotted them as like, semi-transparent um, dots and yeah like here in this plaque area in the middle that's that's where like most molecules fall. So now if we look at like the different ionization technologies that are available for mass spectrometry um, yeah just what, what uh, um, basically like uh, Christopher uh, uh, mentioned we can't really ionize everything with every technique and I think this has particularly very important implications for you when you choose actually the type of like mass spec experiments you want to do to analyze the molecules of, of interest for you. So yeah, here I, I like put in like this like different boxes, which I think, um, yeah, like display uh, the probably most common ionization technologies for organic molecules. Um, and now you can see already like ESI, so electrospray and like MALDI is here like more like in the higher molecular weight area and it's more like on the like the very like polar stuff so we need heteroatoms that we can typically protonate or deprotonate and like on the very right here so like the very lipophilic compounds um, like alkenes or so like with ESI we probably don't get like much of like a, a sensitivity or any like ions at all. Electrospray ionization, on the other hand, here um, indicated as, as EI. This is really like, um, like a more brutal form of ionization where we just like um, bombard the molecules with, with electrons. And this is like more um, accessible to like alkenes. So that's why it's typically used for, yeah, like hydrocarbon analysis in combination with, um, uh, with GC, for example. Uh, and then, yeah, in the middle, we have some other technologies like APCI, this is atmospheric pressure chemical ionization or atmospheric pressure photo ionization. So those are kind of like a little bit like in, in the middle and I think are like more like used in like rare cases. So mainly um, ESI, so electrospray and MALDI and, and EI, those are probably give you like a, a general good coverage. And I think this is also typically the, the, the technologies you have to, um, to choose from. So at the University of Tübingen, for example, um, and including the Max Planck Institute here, I know that we have access to like uh, a lot of ESI uh, instruments, MALDI, as well as a lot of like uh, electron impact um, ionization mass specs, uh, um, in particular in combination with GC, so GCMS. 
And now, yeah, for like um, the, the rest of the seminar, I just want to like go through like um, some of them and yeah, like show you quickly like the principles. So yeah, again, here is a, is a little like overview also like listing, um, yeah, like the, the mass ranges and like the type of like um, ionization products uh, we would get. Um, and it also like indicates like the type of, of, of sample polarity, which I think is like um, really important. One technology I did not mention very much in that um, graph before because it's not used for organic molecules is ICP. So this is inductive coupled plasma. This is uh, in particular used for, for metal analysis. And I think uh, we are within like the, the frame of, of this seminar, we probably won't mention this very much because yeah it's mainly focused on biomolecules but if you're interested in um in in metals for example for siderophores people are using are using those those technologies as well which i think is, is pretty cool um too anyway so now yeah we're working with uh, um, organic molecules and i think that the most like um traditional um ionization method therefore is um electron impact ionization or in, in short EI. And what we do here is simply we introduce samples typically already like in the in the gas phase. So this is either they come out from like the GCMS column uh, from the GC column. So then yeah they're they're volatile molecules and, and they're like um in the gas phase or if we have like a, a traditional mass spec where we can like put in solid samples it's kind of like a stick and then you introduce um, like your molecules into a vacuum chamber and then they like evaporate. But then yeah, basically um, those uh, molecules in the gas phase will then come in here between such a filament. And this is simply an electron beam that goes here um, between like two electrodes. And then what this does is it's just like, it just shoots onto like the um, organic molecule. And when it hits like, um, some of the atoms, it basically shoots out another electron. So what we typically end up with is like here, um, this radical uh, cations. And that's, yeah, like it's, it's a really like, I would say like brutal form of ionizing, which also results in a lot of like fragmentation. So typically what we observe here is that we get like many like smaller pieces of a bigger molecule, which are also like very characteristic. So um, I think, yeah, this is probably one of like the most established uh, mass spectrometry types and in particular for GCMS. And there's like a lot of like compound libraries that show such like EI spectra that um, yeah, are basically uh, a very reproducible type of like fragmentation fingerprint. And then you, you can compare them um, to yeah, what's, what's in, the, in the library. All right. So yeah, it's simple to use. Uh, the setups are, are, are very easy to maintain. It's very reproducible, especially as um, like there's a convention that people use like the same electron voltages, which is typically um, around like 70 electron volts. Um, the analytes must be in the gas phase. So this can be sometimes a problem, especially for, for larger biomolecules. Uh, there's no uh, negative mode. Um, and yeah, the fragmentation is also a problem because it's hard to get molecular ions. So an, an a molecular ion would be basically like an intact molecule that is only a radical cut ion, but where no other bonds were, were broken. So it's not like sh sh shattered in, in small pieces. Um, yeah, then here, like the, the typical EI spectra, for example, for like this uh, piccolo Neil ester from like this fatty acid, which I think is like a classic, um, uh, yeah, um, electron impact application. We can see here, yeah, there's there's many like peaks, um, which yeah, like correspond to like the different like bond breakages here, like along like the azide chain, but also here this piccolo Neil um, ester head group, which nicely like um, yeah, like gets like um, huge. Um, this, this very like uh, yeah typical pattern um, of like the ions. Yeah, here again ionization energy. As I mentioned, so the convention here is that that most of the experiments are, are performed at seventy electron volts, and in particular uh, in combination with GCMS. So I think when you go to the chemistry department, or I think also like in the biology department, there is a GCMS somewhere. Um, yeah, those are like typically the setups you you can find. Um, all right, so then um, 
a modification of uh, electron impact ionization would be chemical ionization or, or CI. So here, again, we have a very similar filament, but now in addition to our analyte, we actually have a reagent gas um, in like this uh, um, chamber, which for example, can be methane. And then we do like a kind of like indirect ionization because we first ionize like our reaction gas in this case, uh, yeah, I think it's uh, methane. And then this like transfers a proton onto our analyte. Um, yeah, which is also like often used in combination with, with GC. And I think this has the nice um, uh, effect that we get less fragmentation and we get like more um, molecular ions actually. So if, if those are like completely unknowns, it's of course like very nice to, to get like first uh, molecular mass as, as a very basic characteristic. Um, it's a little bit less sensitive than, than electron impact uh, by itself. So that's why some people don't use it, but yeah, like many instruments have, have like that capabilities um, as well. All right, so then yeah, here um, a typical um, yeah, like setup uh, would be here a little bit with like higher, um, ionization energy, but then, yeah, again, uh, this is like indirectly going onto um, the reagent gas first and then transfers the proton. And then here, yeah, lo looking at the, at the spectrum um, from uh, three ethanol amine, uh, which has a molecular mass of uh, um, 149. So this would be neutral. Right? Then we see here, this peak was 150. So which means, yeah, like here we get like a proton adduct and yeah, not so much fragmentation. So there's, yeah, like a little bit uh, um, here of, uh, of uh, methanol loss. But um, yeah, it's, it's not as extreme as in the, the spectrum before. Let me go back where you really mainly see fragments. So here, the molecular ion 150 is, is predominant. Okay, so yeah, this is for um, mainly uh, small molecules, also like small nonpolar molecules, but now moving more to like the polar space. And I think this is probably also the, the most important ionization technique I, I'm gonna show you today is electrospray ionization. And um, yeah, the simple reason is that this is what we use heavily in, in our lab. And I think also in Hannes lab and in Christoph's lab, um, yeah, like most uh, metabolomics experiments um, and particular LCMS experiments and also proteomics experiments um, make, make use of like ESI um, as a standard ionization. And yeah, here the main difference is that the molecules when we introduce them are actually not in the gas phase anymore, but they're dissolved in, um, yeah, like in, in, in a um, liquid, in a, in a solution. And that makes it ideal for like the coupling with liquid chromatography. And here, yeah, you can basically see here the, the tip of, uh, of an electrospray emitter. So this is like this little um, like metal capillary here at like the left, so the needle tip. And then there's this thing called a uh, uh, Taylor cone. And then there's here this, this jet, and then there's like this plume, which is really like a, a small spray. And you can, when you actually have a video, I think on the next slide, um, you can see nicely how such a spray um, looks. So yeah, this is a, a simple um, experimental setup uh, where they have like this nice uh, red light here that, that indicates the, um, um, the droplets. And yeah, here on the right now, you see like the, the needle tip and there's like some flow going through. So like some droplets are coming out. And now what you can't see is that they're actually ramping now the voltage um, uh, potential between the needle tip and a metal plate on, on the left. And as they increase the, um, the voltage, you can see now that actually like the droplets start to like fly over. And then once they like reach like a certain like, um, yeah, like uh, potential, then this droplets becomes like a small stream and then actually becomes, yeah, like this beautiful tiny droplets. And I think this is the perfect um, kind of like visualization for actually how ESI works because it's all about getting really, really small droplets. Um, I think, yeah, here in, in the schematic scheme, you, you, can, you can see kind of like the setup, but now in a, um, in a um, yeah, context of like a mass spec. So here, 
Now, again, on the left, we have like our ESI needle. Um, there's also like this green dots are like some, um, some gas. So this is typically used to like aid the, um, yeah, like the evaporation and like the ESI process. So you just blow nitrogen typically um, around that, uh, a second like capillary around that needle. But yeah, most important is here, this needle in the middle and the potential that is put on between that needle tip and then here on the right, the inlet of the mass bag. So now, yeah, what basically happens is that um, through that potential, like charged molecules are kind of like drawn to like the opposite um, electrode, of course, right? So in this case, negative. And then you have like this ESI um, effect where now like the charged molecules with, within that potential are in this droplets. And now, yeah, the whole thing is heated and there's like this drying gas coming from the ESI. And what happens is because we have like this very, very tiny droplets um, that there uh, is, yeah, like here are different molecules and just tiny droplets. And as they shrink and shrink and shrink, there's now kind of like two um, discussed models of like this ESI effect. And one would be that um, simply like the droplets become so small that like all like the positively charged molecules in there would like kind of like um, get too close to each other and then like expel and then kind of like make that tiny droplet explode till there's only like single uh, molecules. And then there's also another, um, uh, yeah, like uh, model discussed where besides like here, like this little like um, um, uh, explosion, we would have actually like an ion evaporation out of that. Um, uh, out of the model. So yeah, those are like the, the two theories, how, how this works. But most important is that we have like these tiny, tiny droplets, they evaporate um, in, in like the ESI source. And we have like this electrospray um, by like putting the potential between the tip of the ESI needle and the inlet of the mass bag. And then, yeah, like once like those droplets become so small that we have um, individual um, ions here, yeah, it's almost like at the tip of the mass back. And then you can see here, there's like the skimmer electrodes that basically now focuses that ions. And through like a difference of like potential, those ions are like literally sucked into like the electric field of the mass back where we then can further ionize. And yeah, again, so this is, this is very important um, because we will heavily uh, rely on this technology in, 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 in our lab, also in Hannes' lab and in many other labs at, um, uh, at the University of Tübingen. So yeah, I think if you take, besides that uh, we need ions uh, and uh, contemporary mass spec displays uh, mass over charge, then ESI would be the second most important thing from today's lecture. Um, okay, so now, one interesting thing here um, is that we can actually switch the polarities. So what I showed you in the, in the slide before was positive mode. So here we have like the um, positive potential on the, on the needle tip and then a negative one on the um, inlet of the mass spec, but we can also just like turn this around. And now instead of cations, here we would actually look at like um, anions. And this has like super important implications again for the analytes you work with. So obviously when you think about like the chemistry of potential molecules, so if you have here a primary amine, for example, it will be very easy to get like a proton on that. But it's probably really hard to get like a proton um, like away from it. Whereas on the other end here, um, when we have like a carboxylic acid, for example, it's very easy to deprotonate them. Right, so like to generate actually like an anion from your molecule and hence like the selection of ESI positive mode or ESI negative mode is going to be super important again for what part of like chemical space you want to you want to like observe. So I think for like most pharmaceuticals and like many natural products people use like um, as a standard method ESI positive but you know if you want to like do lipidomics and you want to like look at like different fatty acids or phospholipids then maybe uh, positive mode might, might not be like the best option for you so I think here again it, it really like uh, requires that that you come in with like some chemical rational and and choose like the, the method of choice um, yeah, of, of choice wisely 
you know, and if you don't know what you're looking for, if you want to do like a very broad metabolic profiling and you don't really know what, what molecules are important, um, it's, I would just recommend to do both, to do then like two LCMS runs, one in positive mode, one in negative mode, just like to cover as much chemistry as possible. Ideally, you would also do GCMS to like cover that other area of, uh, of chemical space to really get like a, a kind of like complete um, picture. All right, yeah, so again, here are just like a couple of like um, functional groups that, uh, yeah, basically like have like different pKa values. And depending on this, uh, is actually relatively simple. You know, like the easier you can like protonate something, the more accessible this will be like in positive mode. And yeah, like the, the more acidic a compound is, the better it will be like in, in, in negative mode. So this is uh, simple chemistry. If you have doubts there, just, to talk with a, with a chemist or with like the um, the people who, who run the mass spec um, for you. This is, yeah, I think like um, typically uh, relatively easy to decide what, what, what method would be best. Um, all right, so now thinking a little bit about biomolecules and especially um, protonating biomolecules. There is of course one thing that is that the bigger a molecule is, the more eventually basic residues it has, right? So if you think about a protein and like basic amino acids such as like lysine, you know, then you have like a lot of like primary amines throughout your molecule. And this has another very important implication which goes a little bit back to uh, what I said at the beginning that we display mass over charge. And this is that we now can have multiple charges per molecule. And what that results in is because here um, on the x axis, you know, we display mass per charge, is that we actually get such charge distributions, right? So here we see like a five times charged, six times charged, seven times charged protein. Um, and yeah, like the mass of them is all like the same, right? Because if I like multiply it by the charge to actually get the, the, the neutral mass, theoretically, like the mass would be always the same. But throughout my mass spectrum, I get like this distribution of different charge states. And even for like small molecules, often I get like a doubly charged um, ion. And then I, I wonder, oh, why does this appear at like 500, even though it, it should be 1000, right? So simply again, because we display mass per charge. So that's why I, I said that this is so important because yeah, like otherwise you, you get like insanely confused um, about like this type of like spectra or, you know, even if it becomes like really big, so here's like all intact um, proteins, like uh, in like top-down experiments, like here, like a, mo uh, like a molecule or protein was like um, 42 kilodalton, we really get like, I don't know, like 50 charges or something. And, and then, yeah, like you get like this, well, I think like beautiful um, uh, spectra with like this typical distributions. So later on in the seminar, we, we will talk more in detail um, about those. And I think it's in particular, Kaya Wan from, from Oliver Kohlbacher's lab will, like represent, uh, will present some deconvolution methods, how we can actually like figure out what those charge states are and how to basically yeah, like deconvolute um, those, those complex distributions to like pseudo um, molecular um, ions, uh, which I think, yeah, for the data analysis is of course really important. So yeah, in a nutshell, basically we look at like differences between like the masses here in this example. And then, yeah, we can come up with like the math um, and actually calculate this charge state here, which then, yeah, of course is important to, to calculate what, what the actual uh, mass of this is. But yeah, now just like to talk a little bit more about like practical points. So how does that look in the lab um, and ESI? Uh, so here, we have a so-called turbo spray, which is kind of like um, you have here the, um, the sample and like the high voltage on like the bottom left. And then, um, yeah, you basically have the ESI here. And then in addition, you have a heated gas probe, which blows like a little fan nitrogen from the side to like really like evaporate quickly or like that solvent and like, yeah, make that those droplets shrink. So this is particularly used by, um, by Sykes or applied biosystems. So if you have a, a one of those mass specs in the lab, you, 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 may, you may have seen that. Um, so yeah, this is the trajectory. Um, and then, yeah, what I think uh, we have in our lab 
and Hannes has uh, on his Agile machines are here such like orthogonal sprays where you kind of like have the spray um, off axis um, and it yeah kind of like hits like the um, like the inlet in a 90 degrees angle so here it comes from the top and the spray goes down there and yeah like only the ions you know because now they can be manipulated by, like, by the electric field actually make like this curve and go into like the inlet of the mass bag. Thermal designs, so we also have it on, on our thermo orbitrap. Um, yeah, those are, those are really nice because if you do not have a full evaporation of like your droplets, those droplets don't like really like fly into like your mass bag as, as it would happen if it, if it would be like on axis, right? So like here, here having um, like this off axis thing kind of like also keeps your, your mass bag simply clean. I think Pruker also has it. So they had chambers on, on their new um, uh, impact tool. They have a very similar design of like their ESI interface. Um, so yeah, just, I don't know if you see it in the lab, then yeah, that's a, a orthogonal ESI. So now there's also like some, some smaller versions of, of electrospray. So it's not really off axis anymore. So now here you can see like the needle tip on the right and then like the inlet on, on the left. And it's like, just like this tiny hole. And what this is here, this is a nano spray. And this really like works with like nanoliters, hence the name. And it's like, it's very, very tiny and it's very, very sensitive. So this is in particular used um, for, for like proteomics. So like, yeah, most shotgun proteomic platforms, they used um, yeah, nano spray in combination with nano LC. And then you yeah, have like this tiny emitters here and yeah, this is how such a like source can look and you have like a camera on and you really need to focus this tiny needle just like at the, at the, at the very like top and then optimize its, its position that it yeah, yields like the, the highest um, sensitivity. So yeah, this is another form of electrospray ionization. Um, uh, yeah, if you're interested in, in protein analysis, in particular proteomics, then this is probably what you most likely will encounter um, in the lab. Um, then, yeah, as mentioned before, there's also like this kind of like fields in between. So atmospheric pressure, chemical ionization, APCI. So now we don't have like the potential here put on like the needle tip, but like here on like a corona discharge needle, which kind of like, yeah, makes like a little bit like such a plasma uh, discharge. And then, yeah, you have a similar effect like in, in, um, as in like ESI and like also like the, the adducts. Um, are typically like protonated species. It's a little bit different in terms of like accessibility for like polarity um, and also like mass range. Um, it's not used super frequently, I think. And then same with like atmospheric pressure um, photoionization. So here, instead of like, um, yeah, like ionizing like the, 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 the molecules was like mainly like the, uh, the electric potential. Um, you now actually have like some photochemistry happening here with like a strong UV lamp where you then, yeah, like um, photo ionize like the molecules inside of like such a, such, such a spray. Obviously there's still some type of potential put on between like the source um, and and uh, um, and the inlet of the mass back because yeah once like ionized you need to like kind of like catch those ions and they need to come into the mass back so again of course there there needs to be a potential um, I'm not sure if there's that technology available in Tübingen but yeah some applications make make use of it I think it's especially more accessible towards like the more uh, non-polar molecules. So maybe for your application, such a thing could be could be relevant. Uh, we we don't have it in the lab, and I've I've not seen it very much. Anyway, just to be um, complete. All right, and now like the other, I think very important uh, ionization methods, and it's also like the last one for today, is uh, MALDI. So MALDI stands for Matrix Assistant Laser Desorption Ionization. And it's really cool because it works with lasers. I think that's, that's awesome. And um, yeah, we also like indirectly ionize basically our analyte. So as the name says, it's like matrix assistant, right? Um, so we have here like this yellow um, molecules in there, which is like the matrix. And those typically um, absorb the energy from the laser and then give it to like the analyte. Um, in, in that case, like here, like the green things. And then, um, yeah, you, you ionize them and then they kind of like 
generate also like a kind of like little plume there. And yeah, this cloud then gets sucked into the mass spec. Um, yeah, importantly, um, all of those matrices have um, a chromophore that absorbs light at the wavelengths of the laser. So hence, there's only like so many like different molecules you, you can use. And yeah, you can see it's mainly like here, aromatic systems. Um, and then yeah, like they're really like efficient in like um, absorbing like this, this, this light energy and then yeah, like moving it on to the, um, um, to the analyte, typically uh, also like in, in some form of protonation. There's also negative mode, so you can also deprotonate, uh, but then yeah, you have like particular uh, matrices that, that are used for like negative mode. And yeah, MALDI has been, been really important also for like the analysis of, of large biomolecules in particular. So intact protein analysis via MALDI, uh, I think is still um, um, a, a very important thing and yeah, gained uh, the Nobel Prize um, almost to a, to a German, to two German scientists, but then it went to, to Japan um, who, yeah, there was a lot of like developments going on like at the same time. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's I think it's, it's pretty, pretty important. Uh, not only for like protein analysis, but also in particular for MALDI imaging. So yeah, this is gonna be the very last thing. So yeah, here, what you can see on, on the top right is, is basically a MALDI target. And yeah, like this colorful spots here, these are like the samples. Um, and yeah, here you co-crystallize the, um, your, your analyte together with like the matrix, right? And now you have like these different spots here, like on this carousel, for example, or like on the right, there's like this plate where you have like many targets on the site. And the cool thing is, that now with your laser, you can like cross those, those, um, those spots relatively fast, right? So like, first of all, this, this is really important um, because um, the throughput of MALDI is per sample in, in like the second range, right? So you, you can like run like thousands of samples really quickly. Also like the sample prep is, is kind of clean because it doesn't see like chromatography, it's only on the target. Um, and then you just put this into, into your mass spec. But, there is another important implication, and that is that you can raster those spots, right? So now as you go over, if you would have like different samples here, you can measure differences. But if instead of um, like those individual spots, you could also now just put on like a more complex sample, like here, for example, like a cut from an agar plate, right? Like at each spot where the laser hits, you can record um, a spectrum and does get a type of like pixel, which is actually represented through a, through a full mass spectrum. So, and yeah, this has been, I think become very um, important over, over the last 10 years or so. And in particular in, in Tübingen, there is an FTICR system at the Max Planck Institute that I think is particularly um, yeah, bought for, for MALDI imaging and also now in the M um, uh, in the medicine department, I think they, they're gonna invest in, in multi imaging capabilities. So yeah, this is this is really cool, of course, to yeah, like analyze your your sample in a, in a spatial sense. And then yeah, when you look at, for example, here interaction of like two colonies here from like this mycobacteria from um, Thomas Hoffman from from Rolf Müller's lab, you can see beautifully how like the two colonies secrete different molecules here indicated through like this different colors. And then there's also some molecules which are only secreted like at the intersome, right? So those are perhaps some, yeah, like antibiotics that one makes to like attack the other, or maybe it's some inhibitors to like defend itself or like, I don't know, like uh, secreted proteins or so. So yeah, I think like the spatial component um, can be like super informative, not only like to, to explore chemical space and find new molecules, but also to study their role. And, and yeah, spatial distribution is, is, is quite key. Yeah, recently this has been also like going to like single cell level. So there was a um, um, really nice feature in, in Nature Methods I think last week that uh, yeah like showed like that the time is, is, is coming really for like single cell metabolomics and I think yeah MALDI imaging has has reached that level together also with SIMS this is secondary ion mass spectrometry but yeah like now I think this is this is really exciting and then yeah we can also of course look at like larger scales. So here, for example, through desorption, electrospray ionization. So this is like a, 
a version of, of, of ESI again, where you actually spray onto a surface first. And people studied here like molecular distributions in like the sleeves. So here yeah, now going like a little bit to like a larger scale. And then also we, uh, um, in Peter Dorsch Science Lab in, in San Diego, we, we applied LCMS and, and just like spatial sampling, for example, of humans or here human habitats, like in here the spa, for example, um, to study like the molecular distribution over like uh, people and, and things. And then, yeah, on, on the very large side, people also use in situ mass spectrometry to, yeah, like, map like um, water bodies in, in the ocean here, for example, for like this uh, um, underwater mass spec, uh, where they systematically uh, were mapping out methane seeps and then yeah, basically showing here where, where the highest um, concentration is in, in, in the water column. And so yeah, like think together, this is really cool. And um, yeah, this is gonna be the last slide um, for today. So yeah, different ionization methods in combination with mass spectrometry are kind of like accessible for um, studying molecules at like different spatial scales as well. So here from like SIMS and, and MALDI and, and DESI to LCMS methods to yeah in, in situ mass spectrometry we can like look at like different like um, scales similar as with like different optical methods um, and yeah study um, chemical exchange of microbial systems or biology in, in, in general. So I think this is really cool. And yeah, I think with that, um, we're gonna uh, close the, the seminar for today. Next week, or no, in two weeks, we're gonna um, talk about how we actually analyze the mass of the molecules once we, uh, um, once we ionize them. And then, yeah, then the week after we go in particular to tandem mass spectrometry applications and then start with, with different um, data analysis approaches. So yeah, thanks a lot for um, your your attention and for, for stopping by. Yeah, we we're kind of like 10 minutes early. Uh, I think at the end it would be great to have like an open discussion anyway. So yeah, if you have any questions, uh, please unmute yourself or write them in the chat and um, yeah, we can have a interactive discussion. Thank you very much. Daniel, I have a question um, regarding the um, how how um, quantitative is the ionization process? So if you have a the spray, it, it um, so it, it's not necessarily that that um, each ion is um, um, yeah transferred to the to, to the machine in the same way as others. So um, can you yeah. comment on this? Yeah, yeah. Thank, thanks a lot for, for this question. This is actually very, very important. Um, and I may have not mentioned this before. So yeah, depending on the ionization accessibility, what I, what I said was like, you know, protonating or deprotonating, for example, like an ESI, there's always an efficiency. So you don't um, really get like 100% of your molecules necessarily ionized. And especially the, um, depending on like their affinity, for example, for like protons, that, that can like change like very dramatically. So unfortunately, um, that being said, like, yeah, mass spec, it's not like I get 100% ionized and, and I have like a, a generalizable like signal response. So very similar as like, for example, like in, in UV spectroscopy, um, you would need to have like compound specific um, calibrations because you have compound specific ionization efficiency. So if you want to quantify something, the, the way to do this is actually get this compound ideally and then like generate like a calibration curve and figure out what the signal response from your mass spec is. So now there are some AI methods to, to actually calculate this and, and use machine learning, for example, and, and some training data to predict those ionization efficiencies. But I'm, I'm not 100% sure how, how reliable this is already. So like, yeah, the gold standard is ideally to have an isotope labeled um, standard that you can even like co-analyze um, during your, your, your quantitative uh, measurements. And of course, because you need that knowledge to have a priori, it's then you're like in the realm of like targeted analysis. So there you really need to know what, you, what you're looking for.
Yeah, hi, cool talk. Thanks. It's really nice. One question. Yeah, do, do you know there are these devices, optical devices, where you can somehow inject single cells into a AC or something? Do, do you know how, how that developed? Uh, so instead of MALDI using uh, some mm. other sources for single cell metabolomics? Mm. No, I, don't, I haven't really seen much of that. But, well, I don't know. Maybe there, there is work out there, but I think it, it would be very, very exciting to do, oh, really? especially in combination with cell sorting, like in, infuse like single cells and then have them pop in inside of like the electro spray. So I, I would assume that there's quite some um, possibilities. On the single cell analysis for, for proteomics, on the other hand, I think this is, this is already like a couple of steps ahead of, of metabolomics. There are people use LCMS-based approaches. And in particular, nano LC, nano ESI, um, yeah, gives you like single cell resolution for, for proteomics experiments. So there's Bruker brought out like a particular instrument for that type of experiments this year. And like the um, MUN lab, I think they, they've published a couple of like uh, really impressive papers last year. Um, so, but there it's actually done that you digest the cell before analysis, right? So you, you kind of like um, lyse the cell, digest the proteins and then do uh, yeah, like single run shotgun. Um, single run. Okay, so the sample prep is different. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, yes, but I mean, it would be of course cool to put in the the, the the cells directly. I think like for, well, particularly for, for, for metabolomics, you don't need like a, a protease yeah. uh, digestion before. So I think this could be in particular um, uh, promising. I don't know, maybe we should try that. We try. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, I see there are some comments uh, in the chat. Um, okay. From Arnau, um, is the work visualize, visualizing the in situ distribution of oleic acid uh, among other lipids published? Well, I don't know in particular a paper that describes that, but I would assume that with multi imaging, you, you could probably do that. Um, well, but it's the question is if it's on a single cell or like on like colonies. So I think, yeah, they're, I don't know, depending on um, the type of cells you're looking at, it might be difficult, especially like because bacterial cells are very small. And I think most of like the single cell multi imaging, for example, by Theodore Alexandrov at uh, Embel in, in Heidelberg, has been done on, on eukaryotic cells. Um, that was also a Nature Methods paper this year uh, called I think Meta Meta M. Also, uh, I can I can send this to you later if you if you're interested. I know. Thanks, uh, Daniel. I think my question had to do with the slide that you showed. Mm -hmm. So you showed a slide with like uh, different fatty acids and also uh, different lipids with MALDI. Okay, uh, let me just go back. I this think it one? was a, your pronunci um this one, exactly this one. Mm -hmm. So if you look closely, it's oleic acid, palmitic acid, and so on. Okay, uh, and in which image? Um, the one with the person. Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, yeah okay, I see. Um, yeah, so this was LCMS based. Yeah, I mean, that's probably like the best um, depths you can get because this is not only mass um, by like MS1, but they're actually uh, Amina and, and the other authors who, who, who did that work were using MSMS. So they had tandem mass spectrometry fragmentation patterns for like the different um, uh, fatty acids there. Um, that's that paper is in, it's in PNAS, I think 2016 or so. Um, okay. And yeah, so I think, yeah, you can get in situ information. It's of course like larger scale, right? So it's, yeah, like cotton swaps from like uh, skin samples. But I, yeah, I don't know, my thinking about your, your projects and, and working with like uh, staff and, and skin microbiomes, that could be of course like exciting. 
Yeah, cheers. I will have a look at that. Thank you. Okay, uh, Nicholas, how much does the solvent, uh, the voltage depend on the solvent? Uh, also a very good question, I think mainly uh, on the flow rate. So there you may adjust like the, um, the spray voltage. Um, I don't actually know how much it depends on like different solvent types. So if you, for example, change from water to isopropanol, so I would assume that this has also like a particular um, optimal spray voltage that I would suggest to tune, right? So you basically change the voltage and just like monitor signal response and then figure out what, what the optimal um, uh, spray voltage would be for, for um, yeah, your particular setup. Okay, then Benjamin, yes, we are recording this um, and I'll upload it later and then paste the link into um, that Google sheet I showed you at the very beginning. Uh, that was also an email I sent around a couple of days ago. So if you open that Google document, then there will be the links for the recordings. Cool. All right, uh, Ify has a question, I see. Yes, I have a question. Thank you so much. Um, so I was wondering before you said that MALDI is really dependent on the, on the chromophores of a compound, right? And how it will absorb of the matrix, okay. So how it will absorb the, the laser, but does it um, depend at all on the, on the size of the molecules, um, on how they will get ionized and if they will get ionized? Because we've, we've had, a, we, we just bought a moldy <laughs> instrument and we're trying to figure out how to, how to optimize things. And we've had a few problems with small, really small compounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think generally it's it's better to be in the little bit higher mass range because simply then you don't get so much um, influenced by like the noise of like your matrix itself, right? So that's the problem with MALDI that like in the small mass range, your matrix also ionize. So you observe like ions and fragment ions from, from those molecules too. So it may overlaps with like the signal you're looking for that can be a problem. Um, it's used for small molecules though. So yeah, I used it for small molecules in Peter's lab um, for MALDI imaging. Um, but yeah, I think it shines probably most for, like for peptides, stuff over like 1000 um, Dalton. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know, I, I would try it. I, th I think it should, in theory, and unless you have like an interfering um, ion at particular, your analyte mass, then it should work. And if that's the case, you can always change the matrix. Um, sure. So typically you use CHCA, right? But then you can use DBA or so. Um, cool. Thank yeah. you very much. Maybe another comment. It's often also like really depending on like the crystallization and like having done a little bit of like uh, MALDI uh, mass spectrometry, I think you can often already tell by like the, um, how like how like homogeneous like the crystals look right and if it's like not like very like um, beautiful crystals but like kind of like an amorph type of like thing then often it does not work that great so like the nicest results are like really when you have tiny tiny crystals that are nicely like distributed um, so yeah sample prep is, is kind of like really important then also in particular for for multi imaging of like um, yeah here those uh, bacterial interactions of, of colonies from agar plates, right? So there, I think like what type of agar you use is often important whether this is gonna work. And it's, it's simple things like some agars, they tend to flake once you, you dry them and then they, the pieces yep. fly away or it's- That's much. exactly, that's exactly what is happening also, yeah. There's, what, what's good, uh, ISP- ISP2. ISP2, ISP2 yeah, uh, that's, yeah. That's, that works really well. Yeah, but the, you need a very thin layer, right, for mm -hmm. for moldy. So then the yes. the bacteria are like I don't know they 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 just are not behaving the same, and they're they're flaky and weird. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, it's a lot of trial and error, I think. Yeah. <laughs> cool. All right. Yeah. If there's uh, not any more questions. Um, let's let's close it for today. Um, 
yeah, feel free to email me or um, I don't know, let's chat next uh, in two weeks afterwards. Would be great to get feedback and then yeah, we can steer a little bit how that, that seminar uh, will go in the future. So yeah, thanks again for stopping by and hopefully see you next time. Bye, Daniel. Bye. Thanks, ciao.